Welcome to the Golden Shadow. My name is Lisa Polizzi. And I'm Aaron Rogerson. Today we're exploring the dynamics of stalled maturation through the lens of Peter Pan syndrome, the Puer Puella complex, individuals who have stayed too long within adolescent psychology. And this is often characterized by an inability to muster one's own mature attitude, to really step into the deeper responsibilities of adulthood. They're really kind of living a provisional life, you might say. And this phenomenon is fairly prevalent nowadays, at least it's in the cultural consciousness, mm. as we're observing people seemingly taking longer and longer to grow up, just as a natural pattern. Yeah. The idea that 30 is the new 20. <laughs> and um, also there's talk of people who just aren't growing up ever mm. at all, mm. people who won't move out of their parents' house. These individuals are mostly men, we tend to think of, but maybe that's not so cut and dry mm. as we tend to think in the culture. But there's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, there's cultural reasons. There's sort of the patterns of modernity, modernity, excuse me, that might disrupt the natural maturation pattern, mm. kind of obliterate natural rites of passage for young people or the kinds of ways in which they're actually going out into the world and sort of claiming their own identity and their own yeah. reality. Those things have changed rapidly in the last several decades. Um, but there's also changes in parenting. There's the idea of being mm. spoiled. There's overprotective parents. There's the prevention of experiencing hardship or difficulty or struggles as a child. And so that kind of relates to the idea of individuation and Peter Pan syndrome could be maybe thought of as sort of stalled individuation or prevented individuation in some mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. You're not really becoming the person that you're meant to be. You're not yeah. really becoming the adult. You're not really becoming, um, you know, the heroic figure that strives out into the world and kind of transforms into um, the king Mm. or something changes mm. from the cane sorry changes from the boy to the cane so there's a lot of things going on here and we're kind of getting at sort of the core pattern perhaps of stalled maturation yeah it's interesting to consider this being more to, of a manifestation of an evolved culture because you don't really have in theory the luxury to be a puer in older more ancient times you mm -hmm. might say like maybe there might have been a propensity or a desire to not really grow up or to not sacrifice your own desires, but that wasn't really an option. And as civilization grows, as technology advances, as there's more a more sense of kind of freedom of how to live one's life, there's more p potentiality for a lot of growth and interesting things to develop, but there's also ways to to grow in bad ways or to not grow, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. So it's just an interesting thing to consider when this really started to crop up and become a, f a noticeable phenomena. And I would think that it, it would be something a little bit more tied to a, the more evolved dynamics of culture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a pattern here over time, definitely. And mm -hmm. as you said, I don't think that remaining a child forever has really been an option for many people in yeah. history because um, you wouldn't survive. Yeah. Um, you know, there's probably cases where there were people who, for some reason, inherited huge amounts of wealth and power mm. who were allowed to maintain sort of a uh, childish kind of behavior their mm. entire life, like mm -hmm. a prince or something like that. I'm sure there's some archetypal mythological pattern yeah, to certainly. that, like the prince who won't grow up mm -hmm. or the, the prince who's not fit to be king mm -hmm. you know, is inheriting that power yeah. regardless. But y we can understand that part of growing up is hardship and struggle yeah. and having to kind of like carve your path through a difficult world. And that's pretty universal. And you can understand why in some ways a natural inclination that we have is to avoid hardship, mm. right? We don't want to go through pain. Yeah. We don't want to suffer. And that's natural. So given the opportunity to avoid pain and suffering, our most basic instinct is to, to take that opportunity yeah. and say, if I don't have to do this work, I won't do it. Mm. Or if I don't have to like suffer this wound, I won't suffer it. Mm. 
And so it makes sense that as culture evolved, as society changed and modernized, that people would be provided increasingly with the option to not experience hardship. Yeah. And that's complicated, mm-hmm. right? Because there's obviously the possibility of too much hardship, yeah. too much struggle. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, I mean, that's what death is, essentially, is your body is being faced with overwhelming hardship or overwhelming mm-hmm. chaos and disorder, you mm-hmm. might say, that kind of rips it apart. Yeah. And that might be in the form of like, you know, I'm starving to death or being hit by a car even those are forms of like too much chaos happening to your body too quickly yeah uh that's possible too much hardship right but the the opposite end of not enough hardship is kind of what we're getting at yes and uh in our modern world it depends depends who you are but Mm. on average i'd say you can get away with doing less work and experiencing less struggle than people probably could get away with in the past yeah yeah but you brought up an interesting point that kind of like was leading me into this tangent in my mind about how in older, more ancient times, there might have been a position afforded an individual in a place of power that may have been nurtured or sheltered in some way that allowed the pu'er to really take hold. And I think that's an important point to really recognize. And mm-hmm. I think you see it in certain fiction or mythology like the first thing that came to mind is one of my favorite fantasy series by the author robin hobb there's like three sons of the king and two of them which I, series um the farseer trilogy farseer yeah farseer yeah. trilogy it's it's one of my favorite series mm-hmm. of books anyways there are the like three main sons and the two older ones are kind of raised in this way of responsibility and duty and being active in military Mm. and really being shaped into kinghood. And then there was a younger brother kind of born a little bit later of another wife who was coddled and overly nurtured and spoiled rotten. And eventually he kind of comes into power and his puer complex is incredibly destructive. Mm. He's moving from this place of selfishness. He is very egotistical. He's narrow-minded. And you see how the puer, when given a, a sense of power, especially the symbolic power of a king, mm-hmm. how it can uh, bring destruction upon you know the symbolic kingdom. Right. So you can think about it in that way through like that kind of fictional story about how when an individual has some level of power in in an environment and they are the one making the choices, it's it's incredibly destructive or it kind of weaves these uh, threads of, of fractures into a place and it really can cause a lot of strife for many people. Right. So with great power comes great yes. responsibility. Yeah, right? that's, true. The, that's the Spider-Man quote. Yeah. But it's true. And that's in in a quote unquote natural world, mm-hmm. you might say responsibility would be coupled with power. Yeah. And what's unusual is when they become decoupled, mm-hmm. when when someone is given power or luxury or yeah. privilege mm-hmm. without the associated responsibility. Yes. They haven't earned it. Right. They're not ready for it. That's why like the princes or the princesses are schooled. Yeah. And put diligently through these kind of training programs, you might say, to Mm. become worthy of their role. And if you take that out of like the sense of like a a royalty having to run a kingdom and thinking about it symbolically in one's own personal life, what are the rigors and the initiations and the rights that you have to go through to shape and challenge your own psyche to finally allow the puer to be uh, transformed into the adult? So we need these tests, we need the challenges, we need to be pushed out of our comfort zones mm-hmm. so that we be, we're prepared really to step into that place of, of self-responsibility. Right. Some other myths, modern myths, I'll say, mm-hmm. um, that I'm reminded of are um, Joffrey yes. in Game of Thrones. Yes, that's right? a good one. Yes. Um, I mean, he is kind of a child in the story, but he's given a huge amount of power and but, he doesn't have the, yes. the uh, maturation to yes. wield it properly. They they needed a heavier hand with Joffrey, right. you know, and he was allowed free reign to really exercise all of mm. these pretty intense emotional desires yeah. that he had. But on the flip side, you have Tommen, right? The younger brother mm. who approached his kinghood in a much more responsible way. Yeah. Yeah, and listen to Tywin, who is sort of the the Senex, you might say, who's like the old wise Mm -hmm. commander who has the responsibility and earned it 
and he coupled with the Puer cane, mm-hmm. things kind of remain stable and balanced. Yes. Um, also, Commodus from Gladiator. <laughs> he's like the son. I mean, he's he's a real historical figure, but he's fictionalized in Gladiator. But he's yeah. the son of Marcus Aurelius, and um, he inherits. Well, he murders his father. That's part of the plot, and he inherits the um, empire of Rome. Mm-hmm. And he's not responsible. He's uh, a sort of shameful, immature, um, spiteful yeah. emperor, mm. and he doesn't deserve his power. And mm. so, I can't really, actually. There, there's probably more examples of this, but um, we digress a bit. I would say. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about Peter Pan. Yeah, the myth of right. Peter Pan. Yeah. Peter Pan's interesting because it's the story that was crafted in the early 1900s, but man, did it really capture the collective consciousness uh, in a powerful way that it's not only become this treasured childhood story, but also been morphed into this association to the the adult who won't grow up. Mm -hmm. So Peter is the boy who refuses that maturation process and lives in a place of fantasy forever in Neverland. Mm -hmm. And there's all these really interesting symbols and dynamics going on in the story. Uh, Like in the beginning, he's lost his shadow, and so he's chasing it around trying to find it, and that takes him up to where the the darling's house is, and he meets Wendy and the brothers. That's interesting. He loses his shadow. Yeah. That's not really something I thought about. I don't don't know if we should imbue that dynamic with too much meaning as far as like the uh, the Jungian shadow goes, where it's like the child is not in contact with his unconscious, (laughs) right? It's just like he loses his shadow and the shadow runs free without him. Yeah. And it's like he doesn't have the responsibility to properly integrate the shadow. Yeah, yeah. So the, the shadow is like going off on its own. Yeah. Anyways, just interesting. And it's a little trickstery, I think. I'm like I'm trying sure. to bring these images to mind from the movie of mm-hmm. like the, the shadow kind of like dodging him and stuff. So right. his shadow is even more trickstery than Peter Pan is, who he's honestly a, a pretty trickstery hero type um, main character you might say but um yeah so you have this whole story of watching the dynamics of an individual who won't grow up but also pulling other people into it you know he brings wendy and the brothers Mm. and there's also this sort of perpetual cycle that even when wendy decides to grow up to return to england or to not keep going to neverland that peter returns for her daughter and then her daughter after that so there is a sense that the puer will try and keep pulling individuals mm. into that space because they don't want to grow right right and that, that's part of like sort of the original uh, play uh-huh yes right yeah so he keeps bringing the daughters yeah back in yeah or the original story the original that story that's from the play. Not, not the disney movie it's no no before yeah before that but mm-hmm. but that is part of um Peter Pan syndrome, the, some pattern that's associated often with the Peter Pan syndrome in, in men is that they will just date younger women mm. and they'll continuously try to date younger women mm. because it's a way to escape maturation. Mm. They yes. can kind of stay playful. And right. Cause they're not at low that, stakes yeah, they're not at that and, point in their life. Right. Right. The, the, the 60 year old man is actually, you know, 20 inside. <laughs> right. And so he dates someone, a girl who's 20 and it's mm. like, we can both be 20 together. And, right. So that's interesting. Yeah. That's, that, that dynamic is happening in Peter Pan. Mm-hmm. Um, some other things that kind of came to mind with the story is is his uh, his adversary with Hook, who is kind of like a Senex figure, you might say, being that yeah. kind of opposing to the trickster Puer. Uh, Puer, by the way, is Latin for like a young boy, Puella, young girl. Right. So, Senex is. Sort of old man established a sort of kind of like yeah. a, a dualism, like two directions, yeah, like towards the puer, mm-hmm. towards the senex, mm-hmm. as yeah. far as maturation, yes, the, yeah. young, the young boy or the inner child, and, yeah, and the wise man, right? And not that hook is like particularly like wise, well, or yeah, he's not the, to, the virtuous, senex, yeah, he's not I a guess vir- you could exactly, say he's yes. like the shadow senex, yeah, he's like a like a, some a, sense. a negative valence to him, and yeah, he, him and Peter are caught in this like eternal battle. But what I find really compelling looking at it through that symbolic eye is that not only is Peter being chased by the Senex, but they're also being chased by the alligator who's got the clock Mm -hmm. inside of his belly. And there's that tick, 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 tick. So time, time time is chasing Mm -hmm. after both of them as well. 
and there's that interesting consideration of what it means for the 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 individual who will not grow up. You know, time's going to catch up with you at a certain point. Right, but Peter is not really bothered by the alligator. No. He's not bothered by time. But he doesn't feel but afraid. Hook, but Hook is. But Hook is. And yeah. Hook is the the adult mm-hmm. who actually has a strong concept of time. Yeah. And is afraid of it. He and is afraid of it, yeah. Maybe there is some sense of like needing to get things done and yeah. needing to be responsible and yeah. sort of uh, do things on time. Yeah. And that, that's sort of adults can get kind of overly fixated with yes. like time and like mm-hmm. having to take care of business. Mm. And so there is, again, this tension that we, you know, already, there's a balance, right? And we're, we're talking about this tension between being overly childish being and then being overly um, an adult. Right, or, and, yeah, rigid. But, and there's there's a bias on either side. Yes. Where it's like you're being too rigid, you're being too, you have too much of a, a sense of maturity that it's preventing you from seeing mm. a lot of the beauty in the world or the playfulness yes. or the openness yes. or how to have a good time, enjoy yourself, mm-hmm. experience emotions and feelings. Yes. So there's something, something that's at play yeah. with this myth. Yeah, that starts to tap into that complexity behind the terminology that we're using or even the implications of the more kind of Latin side of the terminology with the puer eternus being uh, the eternal child Mm -hmm. and that the eternal child does have this quality that has to be cultivated within oneself but kept in balance and that that is this kind of important energy that has to be held onto while you also mature. And that's like the tension as one grows up is like, how do you integrate uh, being a youth into becoming an adult? And that's actually a really different uh, threshold. It's a difficult threshold to really cross. And people who are kind of stuck in Peter Pan syndrome are stalled at that threshold, you might say. Right. So the Wasp Boys... Another important yeah, lost boys. symbolic um, group in the story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is um, all these children that are kind of stuck in Neverland. Mm-hmm. And Peter is their leader. Yeah. And I don't, I, again, I don't really know the original play very well, but is there much of a backstory for Peter or the Lost Boys um, of how they got? Stuck in Neverland it, or how they ran away It implies that like they were like lost from like Kensington Gardens, like that these were real children mm-hmm. who like somehow ended up in this place or that it's kind of like a a metaphor for how the author's brother died at a young age at like age 14 and he kind mm-hmm. of lived on eternally. So mm-hmm. there's this or- sort of feeling of like, are these children kind of, you know, deceased and kind of living on as these images of children forever but also that these actual lost boys or even Peter might have been children in England that were lost or maybe they ran away. So that's kind of more of like the mythic side of it or the fictional side and they don't want to return home. Mm -hmm. Um, Although the lost boys do eventually go back with Wendy. Right. So the pattern here of Peter wanting to recruit people to mm-hmm. be a puer with him yes. eternally yes. and recruiting people to Neverland and saying, let's stay here and play forever. Yes. And you can see this playing out in the culture yeah. and in social scenes perhaps mm-hmm. where there are individuals who really would like to continue their their way of life without having to change, mm-hmm. without experiencing any hardship, yes. without sort of facing reality. And they can sort of create a vortex around them yeah. of um, only people that are around them who will enable them yes. to continue their yes. lifestyle. I have another important thing to bring up in regards to that mm. because Wendy's role, do you remember? Like why she actually goes to Neverland? Well, she's like mom. Exactly. Yeah. So the puer complex, especially from like the Jungian point of view, is very much tied to the mother complex or having this tie to like the symbolic energy of mothering Mm -hmm. where that over nurturance is keeping an individual kind of in the nest. And Wendy comes in as the mother to the lost boys and it's because something is missing, right? Like the puer wants to be held in the arms of the mother because they haven't felt... uh, ready or they don't have that sense of maturation to leave the mother. So there's that yearning for that comfort and that safety and also like whatever they provide that kind of keeps that environment as it is. Mm -hmm. So Peter 
is recruiting Wendy to come be the mother. And that's a really important thing to recognize with the, the Peter Pan syndrome in kind of regular uh, uh, life and reality, that mm-hmm. there is this, this yearning for something to keep nurturing um, yourself and the environment to stay the same. Right. So seeking out individuals around you who will continue to play with you, mm. continue to enable your lifestyle yeah. and perhaps staying around your real parents, mm-hmm. staying around real mom who will keep, keep taking care of things yeah, for sometimes. you or trying to replace mom with someone else yeah. who's going to continue to take care of you. Right. Yeah. So we brought up the idea that a puer type might be searching for a significant other that might be a child mm. so they can continue to play together mm-hmm. or the poor might be seeking a mother yeah, mother and a significant other yes. who will continue to take care of most of the responsibility yeah. and they sort of uh, feed in to their um, proclivities for, you know, um, superficial, simple, cheap, fun ways of being mm-hmm. and not really ever getting into sort of like the darkness of life, yes. the reality, the hardship, the shadow contents. Mm-hmm. So how does this myth end? I'm wondering, is there some sort of, <laughs> cause you know, like what, what's, what's like yeah. the, uh, the lesson here, if, if we're paying attention to this myth as some sort of a uh, lesson about yeah. this pattern or about life? Well, it's interesting because there's the recognition that Peter decides to not grow up. Like he, he fights it. He gets angry at Wendy for wanting to go back. Eventually the Lost Boys do leave, but Peter perpetuates. So you might say that he is like the eternal Pu'er. Like Mm. his is not a story of redemption where he decides to grow up. He is that snapshot of what it means to be stuck in the Pu'er complex. So Mm. that to me is the heart. It's very similar to me. Um, The Peter Pan story brings more of that essence of the fairy tale yeah. rather than like the large mythic story with a, a real arc of closure, but it's more mm. like this snapshot of like complex dynamics and life experience. And it, and it right. shows the pitfalls of staying within the Pu'er complex, but it also kind of hints at what may be if you were to leave that, like you see Wendy leave and she becomes an adult and she can n- nurture the lost boys in a, and usher them into adulthood rather than keeping them stuck in the puer state. Mm -hmm. And Peter on the flip side continues to be a child. Um, But one thing I thought would be kind of fun to talk about is the adaptation of the kind of sequel, you might say of hook the film, which certainly is maybe not like actual Peter Pan canon, but um, it's a great, it's a great film. Might as well be now. (laughs) That film is so well known. Yeah. Steven Spielberg. I think. So Robin Williams mm-hmm. plays Peter Pan. Yes. And he is a working man mm-hmm. now. Yeah. And is he this man? has a family. He has a family. He has children. Mm-hmm. And he is completely engrossed in his work. Yes. Right? That's how the movie starts. Yeah. It's like he's he like, won't put down the phone yeah, or he won't relax and yeah. start enjoying his vacation. Right. He's still trying to make deals. Yes. Yeah. I can't remember what his job is. Just, just like kind of like token um, businessman. Business, yeah. um, we got to make the deal. We got to make the deal. Right, right. And like so there's this illustration of like things have gone too far in yes. the other direction. Yes. Right. So we recognize there's vice in not growing up. Mm-hmm. There's vice in being stunted. There's vice in the child. Mm-hmm. But there's a balance here. And the opposite problem for a lot of people, yeah. is the opposite of Peter Pan syndrome. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not sure if there's uh, any technical term for what that would be or whether or, not, whether or not that would even be considered like a disorder, Yeah, even though Peter Pan syndrome is not considered like an official no, recognized disorder. Yeah, it's not. But um, the individual who has completely lost touch with the inner child mm-hmm. and they've sort of become like hardened, like cold hearted. Yes. They're vessels of productivity. Mm-hmm. They're sort of sacrificing the feeling perhaps even loving side of themselves Mm -hmm. in favor of getting something done. Yeah. And so (sighs) Peter in Hook has gone too far in the other direction. Yes. Almost like he's gone from one extreme to the other and has failed to find the proper balance in between. Yeah. That's the story of Peter growing up and banishing 
the child to the shadow. Mm -hmm. And the entire arc of the film is that Peter has to go back to Neverland and reclaim the young Pu'er. He has to learn how to fly again. He has to learn how to imagine. He has to become the leader of the lost boys. He has to save his children. And he can only do that by tapping into that part of himself that he had repressed. Right. So that shows this interesting dynamic of what happens when we might have a recognition maybe of Mm -hmm. like, oh my God, like what am I doing with my life? And then you swing so far in the other direction that you're still in a kind of pathological dynamic, you've just replaced it with something else. Yeah. And to me, the the kind of moral of this story is trying to hit that sweet spot between the two, that Peter can mature and step into adulthood, but not lose the puer eternus. We, we, the eternal child within each of us is an incredibly important archetypal structure that helps us feel connected to this imaginative, creative, open, loving part of our being. And when we banish it, when we get too wrapped up in these uh, structures and rigidity, we will suffer just in a, in a different way than the puer. So let's get a little bit deeper into maybe the real life pattern mm. of Peter Pan syndrome mm. or the eternal child yeah, or the Puere Eternus. It's not clear that all those things are actually synonymous, but we're essentially using them as synonyms. But um, we're talking about being spoiled, right? Yeah. That's, that's a pretty commonly used phrase to describe people who have refused to grow up or have failed to launch or they have stalled maturation. Mm. And what I think is sort of interesting about this idea is it's not necessarily just an individual thing, but it can also be kind of like a cultural thing. Yeah. And one one term that is used, I think, that describes a similar pattern is decadence. Mm. We won't get too deeply into that, but mm. the idea that a culture has become so privileged mm. and has had so much peace and luxury for so long that it's actually become out of touch mm. with reality, with hardship. And when that happens, like some crazy flood, you might say, we did an episode on the flood, but some crazy disaster or some destructive force can just come and level the culture because it's not resilient anymore. Mm. It's not anchored. Mm. It's not grounded in um, a kind of structure that, um, you know, helps give it strength and purpose Mm. and drive Right, so this can be ha- this can happen in the individual, it can happen in a group of people, it can happen in a social scene, it can be in a community, but it can even be an entire society. Yeah. And so we have to recognize that this is a larger pattern in society mm. of people taking longer to grow up or relinquishing responsibility um, for whatever reason. Yeah. And it's it's not so much that individuals are making this choice intelligently as it's just sort of happening to them. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people are kind of suffering because they're not actually going through the proper um, stages of growth and education that they actually really need. Right. So... Well, it seems counterintuitive, right? Because yeah. to, to really lean into maturation and individuation is to confront oneself with difficulty and challenge, with confrontation, as much as you have inspiration and potential and all of those nice things that kind of fuel development, you have the flip side because there's always, you know, that double-sided coin to all of these archetypal dynamics. Hmm. And the darker experiences shape us just as much. So when that falls away, for whatever reason, you start to see the imbalance forming where an individual or society's actual resiliency is 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 pretty hollow. It's like a farce. It's like maybe on the surface this person looks like they're resilient or they have the inner strength or they have a sense of deep character, but actually they don't. And that gets put to the test when something starts to happen in life. And then what does the puer do? They might try to skirt those responsibilities. They try to run away from it at all costs. That feeling of pressure, of challenge, of limitation is something that elicits a feeling of of uh, anxiety, of I don't like this. You mm-hmm. know, it's there is a total adverse reaction to it when instead, to some degree, we as individuals, I believe, need to be open to the discomfort and the challenge and the confrontation. Right. So there's, 
you know, this notion of balance again, but of being on the edge of chaos. Yeah. Not being too far inside safety, Mm -hmm. but also not being too far inside danger. Like both uh, are going to result in improper growth. I mean, if you're, if you're too far in danger, like you might die or you might be injured or Mm. wounded or traumatized and we don't want that. Right. You don't want to be so, as I already said, you don't want to be so exposed to hardship that it actually wounds you in a permanent way. That's not good. We don't want to impose that upon people. And the flip side is being too far inside safety. So there's like, you know, like the, the walls of the city, if you're just too safe inside the city walls, you're not learning or growing you're not changing. You're not being forced to individuate mm-hmm. in any way. Mm-hmm. But if you're outside the city walls in the wild where like the monsters and the dragons are, like you'll just be t- torn to pieces. Yeah. So you want to somehow kind of be on the border. And there's ways that you can, you know, sort of will yourself to stay on that border and to do things that scare you regularly and mm-hmm. to expose yourself to um, challenges kind of develop a hunger for challenge, develop a hunger for things that kind of um, push you and stretch you and Mm. kind of twist you around. And, you know, we recognize that with like physical exercise, obviously that like beating up your body just a little bit is actually good. Mm -hmm. Going for a run, lifting weights, doing yoga, your body might hurt afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that's because you're actually exposing it to proper hardship and it grows strong. Right. If you don't exercise at all, like your body's going to freak out and mm-hmm. it's not going to know what's happening. It's not going to grow properly, yeah. especially for people who are developing, yes. people who are young, people, children, children need physical activity. And if you keep a child away from physical activity, they don't grow physically properly. Yes. And the same is true for our emotional world, yes. for the, for our psyche is there needs to be proper exposure to that danger, yeah. that kind of pulling and pushing and twisting Mm. um that really sculpts you into the person you're meant to be someone Mm. who can handle um irregularities who can handle sort of unexpected challenges things come your way that disrupt the order of things and you need to know how to act in those situations put the pieces back together Mm -hmm. um but this also ties into parenting yes yes that's the point i was gonna make (laughs) right so you're trying to treat yourself this way but it's also the parent's role is to be the guardian yeah the guardian doesn't just keep the child out of the water Here's Mm -hmm. here's a different metaphor um that i like but if you're a parent and uh, let's say the ocean is life i guess you could say it's like you might want to keep the child out of the ocean because you're so afraid that the child's going to drown Mm. that you're just like you can't go in yeah but that's not good for the child because mm-hmm. the child never learns how to swim. Yeah. And then when the, the parent disappears, what the hell is the child going to do? Yeah. Like he needs to get into the ocean. So you would wade with the child into the shallows and you would let them play around in there and you would kind of show them how to swim and you would run and grab them if they get too far out and keep them safe. And as they grow, you give, let them go a little bit further out. Maybe you let them actually swim out by themselves just a little bit and come back real quick. Mm-hmm. And they grow even more and they get yeah. older and then they swim out even further and you're mm-hmm. giving them tips and making sure they're safe. And maybe there's a shark every once in a while that you need to swim out and like punch in the face, <laughs> like to protect your kid. But eventually the kids is going to swim off into the ocean forever. And you have to say, you're ready, go. Mm. And it's not just like, well, what if he drowns? It's like, that's life. Yeah. You have to let them go into the unknown well, eventually. also have confidence in the training right in, mm-hmm. in how you guided them through this process of development that you strengthen their muscles that you gave them courage to not fear the water and you, having resolve as a parent in your teachings and that you've done your best and then also recognizing that you know as your child swims out they might get caught in you know a current and they're gonna have to figure out how to get out of it but they know that they should swim sideways and like get out of that undertow. Like there are all of these skill sets and lessons and insights that you've given. And then they need to put that to the test and overcoming those challenges continues to show the, the youthful psyche that it has the ability to move deeper and deeper into life. And that's why you see that kind of, over nurturance as a characterization of the Puer syndrome because an individual has had all of their challenges or hardships or a high degree of them taken by somebody else. And that 
doesn't shape the character to be courageous. Yeah. So there's certainly some failures here. And again, I, I don't think it's really very useful to blame anyone. Mm. Um, but there's failures in education and there's yeah. failures in mentorship mm. and there's there's failures in rites of passage. Yeah. Yeah. There's all these things that young people should be going through mm. to help them be initiated into adulthood yeah. that aren't happening. And it's hard to say what they should look like exactly mm -hmm. or even what they were in the past. Obviously, we have concrete examples from history that we can look at to be like, what was the aging process for young people in this tribe or in this society? And those things are missing now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not clear how to bring them back. But there is a, is a failure here for for young people to have the proper environment in which to grow. Yeah. And that's a real tragedy, I think, because there's so many young people who are being sort of like spat out into the world who mm -hmm. just have no idea how to do this. Yeah. yeah, They don't know how to swim and yet they're thrown into the ocean anyways. Mm. And th there's so much trauma that comes from that. Mm. There's so many broken relationships. There's so many wasted resources even yeah. that just go into trying to slap Band-Aids on these terrible... Um, tragic patterns that young people find themselves in and it's it's hard to go back and fix that yeah you know it's yeah. like you have like a kind of like an opportunity when children are ages mm -hmm. between the ages of like 10 and 20 i guess i would say i mean earlier than that obviously but 10 mm -hmm. and 20 is really key there's like a there's that time to experience that maturation process in a mm -hmm. proper way and if you miss it it's not clear that you can kind of go back and do it yeah it's, it might be like too late you're bringing up an interesting point for me, which is considering like the Puer Puella from this sort of different position where I think at times the mindset is dominated by a sense of like inflation and their mm. like self-importance is incredibly high. Yeah. Uh, wanting independence and freedom. They don't want to sacrifice their personal desires and dreams. They don't want to be tied down. They don't like boundaries and limits because mm -hmm. it's always been like maybe, you know, give, give, give anything you want, what, what you desire goes. But on the flip side might be the, the Puer Puella it's coming from maybe like a more deflated personality and that sense of childhood fear and anxiety is what characterizes the psyche because yeah. you brought up like the kind of failures of like the education system as an mm -hmm. example, which I think is really important. Mm -hmm. It's like how many of us graduate like we don't even know how to open a bank account. Right. We have to decide our college majors. We don't even know who we are. We haven't been initiated into adulthood in any capacity. Yeah. And there's a real sense of just being thrown out into the deep end. And for some people lacking uh, the feeling of support or the knowledge or skill set just retreat from life they kind of withdraw in a way and they get stuck in a kind of adolescent place where they might just want to hermit and play video games and never truly grow up because life is too scary right right it kind of makes me think of i hadn't, I hadn't thought about this before but i feel like young people but at least in our culture i can't can't speak for the rest of the world but like in, in our culture the young people experience a lot of negative feedback hmm. like they go through bad experiences they go through bad relationships, bad breakups. Maybe they're actually abused as children. Um, they go through a lot of feelings of failure. They try to do things in school and in sports or all kinds of extracurricular activities and they fail. Mm -hmm. And there's all these lessons that come from that, right? Lessons yeah. that come from failure. Mm -hmm. But like what's really lacking is like where's the positive reinforcement? Mm -hmm. Like where like the, the, the life lessons, like yeah. the wisdom, these sort of structures that are built to kind of like provide you with the kind of um, patterns of growth and orientation and skills for navigation. Yeah. Those are really lacking mm. in a lot of ways. So it's, yeah. it's not just you throw young people into the thresher and like they grow up <laughs> because they were just slapped so many times yeah. and poked and stabbed that now they're adults. It's like, no, I, that, that, <laughs> That's the hardship's important, but like what's really lacking is like where are the mentors or where, yeah. where are the people that you can talk to to say like, I don't know how to navigate my romantic relationship with my partner mm. and I'm 15. Mm -hmm. Like who do I talk to? It's yeah. like you can talk to your parents, but often that's not, doesn't feel very appropriate or helpful. Mm -hmm. um, 
your friends don't know any more than you do. And yeah. maybe you have like the occasional like virtuous teacher who goes above and beyond who can mm-hmm. provide this idea. But it's like a lot of that is, is lacking. Yeah. And again, it's not clear like exactly why it's not clear if like who's to blame for this like mm. or anything like like this was like intentionally structured this way it's like mm, it's not clear a lot of it's just sort of dissolved or fallen away over time mm-hmm. a, lot of the, a lot of the roles that would have been filled by family or members of your small community right. or village or tribe yeah or spiritual leaders things like that yeah those things have kind of um retreated in their access yeah. or just completely um receded in their existence and that's that's a tough question. Yeah, it points to dynamics within society where the uh, the kind of interwoven web of community helps support each other so that it all doesn't fall on like one or two parents. It's like how can you be everything to your children? Like mm-hmm. you cannot. It's I can't imagine how difficult it is to be a parent. I am not one, but doing it in the context of present day reality where often the the weight of responsibility for keeping food on the table, four walls up, supporting your children, not messing them up too much, like taking care of yourself, cultivating your romantic partnership, yeah. your family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's so much. But yeah. when you have like a dynamic of a community that comes together so that the child can turn towards an older cousin as an Mm -hmm. example or a spiritual leader or a grandma or grandpa it's the it's spread out and then also all of those individuals give their own unique wisdom Mm -hmm. and you want little pieces from all of those people you don't want to just have a small uh subset of of energy and opinion and insight you want it to be diversified amongst all the individuals who have had these different walks of life and i think maybe some people do still have that if they're in closer uh, knit communities or they have a larger extended family but for a lot of us i don't think that is as present and that is a loss just briefly why why does it seem like this pattern is more prevalent in men Mm. than in women peter, yeah. pa- peter pan syndrome usually you think of men mm-hmm. it's the whole idea of like the man child yeah. it's thrown around a lot right. nowadays man child. Mm-hmm. and uh, i guess the question is like is is it actually true that this is more prevalent in men than women or is it just sort of a strange illusion because this looks different in men yeah. than it looks in women mm-hmm. is there a cultural standard that we have inherited that forces too much responsibility on men to appear as, you know, these authorities, mm. these um, these bringers of order and structure yeah. and breadwinner, and mm. that when that fails, the contrast from that sort of cultural archetype is more extreme in mm. men than it is for women. Yeah. What do I, you think? Yeah, I think that's true, definitely. It, there has to be a recognition of, like, the archetypal sort of typical patterns that are happening and the... Uh, the natural kind of relationship that we have to it, the expectations, the recognition that we seem to associate Peter Pan syndrome more to men or to a man child. It's like, what's a woman child? I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that ever. Yeah. Um, so that's part of it. I think Peter Pan syndrome it nests under the masculine archetype a little bit more, but I think it also does look different for women because the the natural sort of heroine's journey takes a woman through a different progression where kind of getting stuck in the Puella uh, complex is going to have a markedly different sort of manifestation than men. And it's it's tough to say that it it's obvious from the uh, kind of outward manifestation, like what's happening with uh, either a man or a woman. But I think for for women, if I was to really kind of lean into that, I would consider that you could see them moving through what appears to be a type of maturation, even having a child, which forces you into maturity, yet still there's a part of the psyche that has not really grown up. There's like the denial of motherhood, being stuck or wanting, having almost like, what's the the typical kind of feeling of it, of, of feeling uh, not regretful, but there's... Um, 
like they're angry that they became a mother or like, it's like, I didn't want this responsibility. There's just a desire to just toss that out. Mm-hmm. But in some ways you're still so tied as a mother to the child. The abandonment of a child is not something we typically see with mothers. Yeah. There's just a greater kind of biological connection, but the resentment, that's what I was looking for, can still be there. So I think for women, it it just does look very, very different. Mm. And we have to recognize that the masculine experience is different and that maybe that journey for the typical masculine psyche is one that requires you to kind of venture out in a different way. And if you lacked some of those initiations and rites of passage, the failure is much more obvious than it is for women. Yeah. Men are more explicit than women yeah. in the way they manifest in the world. And I think we tend to think of men as demonstrating their maturity, you might say, by pretty explicit acts. Yeah. Like, what have you built? Um, True. Mm-hmm. What's your status? Mm-hmm. How much money do you have? How big's your family? Mm. These are things that we kind of normally, like that's how we kind of judge men or we think of men as being in the world in a very explicit way with tangible results. And I think with women, there is more of a sense of sort of an implicit pattern they have, Mm. an implicit way of being in the world where there's a lot going on inside of them. But there's not as much expectation for them to kind of command a lot of materials or have a bunch of land or have a big car or something like that. Mm. And I think that's like partly partly a intrinsic um, human nature thing, but it's also very strongly a cultural thing. Yeah. So that's the expectations that we put up, put on men. Um, men also swing more wildly in their manifestations than women. Mm. Women are more general. They're more balanced. Mm. They're more kind of even keel. And men tend to, again, as you said, the kind of men, the way that men sort of venture outward. Yeah. They're kind of doing this thing where they, they sort of go out into the world. And this can be in a, a metaphorical sense or even sort of intellectual sense. They kind of go out and explore mm. and get fixated on projects and so it's a lot more likely that men are going to be more extreme in the work they do or their interests Mm. or even their risk taking where they're much more likely to fail so i think you can see that part of the downfall of modernity is men getting a little more extreme about things like video games or hobbies or smoking weed or doing drugs so they're more likely to kind of be that extreme puer than women. Mm. And they're also just more drawn to the virtual reality space, by which I mean the internet. Not just like VR specifically, but like the internet is, is just one big virtual reality that's becoming more and more kind of complex and detailed as time goes on, where you know, Twitter is a virtual reality. It's like not clear that Twitter, the things you read on Twitter, it's not clear they actually map onto reality at all. Mm. They might just be totally virtual. The things yeah. people say, is this a fact? Is this true? No, I think it's been demonstrated clearly it's not. So men, I think, are more likely to get sucked into kind of the vortex of virtual reality. Mm. Video games, obviously, um, is more of a male thing. So there's a lot of things going on here, but I definitely think the Peter Pan syndrome, the puer eternus is is much more common in men. Um and again, I think it's a tragedy. Mm. It's terrible. Yeah. I think that a lot of men out there are really messed up yeah. and they don't know how to go out into the world and like claim it for their own, mm. claim themselves, um, become the person that, you know, they're meant to be. Um, yeah, there's a way that both men and women get caught in the puer puella cycle and you can see very obviously like that there's a sense of, them being stuck, you know, can't commit to a job, Mm -hmm. haven't accomplished much. It's a shared experience, but it's also important to, to look to the greater patterns that we might see. And then how does that speak to underlying structures that are being stressed? And how is that tied to societal dynamics, cultural dynamics that are feeding into it? And if you're someone who feels like they're struggling with that, you can start to look in at those, those ties and those roots to that that sense of kind of being stuck in ambivalence of not being able to commit to struggling to really grow up where, where does it come from within you and how can you begin to both nurture the eternal child within so that you don't lose it, but also push it into, uh, or you might say out of its comfort zone so that you could actually embrace what adulthood is trying to bring to you.
All right, we have a dream from a 32-year-old female, and here's the dream. I was Frankenstein's monster running away from someone. He used to be my friend, but was now hunting me. He chased me over hills and valleys and past an oval where kids were playing soccer. The kids' parents were people I went to school with. He chased me up an alley, and I jumped a fence and hid in a warehouse behind a parked car. He was prowling the alley, and now I saw he was a cyborg. I had to stay low on the gravel, or he would see my shadow. He left, and a pregnant woman entered the warehouse. I sensed she was connected to my pursuer, but that she would not hurt me. I gave her a chess piece, a queen. Hmm. This dream has some kind of classic dynamics going on of the chase of interacting with that unconscious shadow material in our dreams and kind of having that sense of anxiety and pursuit. And oftentimes that's where it ends in dreams, Um, that feeling that something's going to come get you. But sometimes it changes. And that's a, a detail that I feel is really important to make a note of here because the the material that's chasing the ego consciousness shifts. And so we see within the dream itself that whatever's happening in this individual's psyche is being mirrored here. And what appears to be a kind of um, intense figure giving chase turns into a pregnant woman, which is such a different image and symbol for this um, shadow material, you might say. Hmm. Imagining that you are Frankenstein's monster is pretty strange. Yes. That seems a little heavy. It's very heavy, yeah. I'm trying to think back to how many times I've actually imagined myself (laughs) as being like not myself, but being some kind of like creature. And I feel like it's pretty rare. But if the association if the association with Frankenstein's monster is pretty direct and typical, mm-hmm. you might say it's perceiving yourself as a freak, yeah, or perceiving yourself as sort of a collection of parts that yeah. don't actually belong together. Yes, yeah. Um, maybe you perceive yourself as being like green skinned hmm. and having weird metal pieces coming out of you, in the yeah. sense that like you're not fully human. Yeah. Um, that you've been placed in this environment artificially and you don't actually belong here. In mm. fact, you don't even belong in existence yeah, yeah. at all. And that's sort of Frankenstein's monsters struggle. It's like, why was I born? Yeah. Why was I created? Feeling alienated because you are monstrous mm. and not necessarily by one's own hand, yet you have to suffer the reality of it. Mm-hmm. The dreamer mentions in the form that they had been going through a couple of years of depression and anxiety And through that process had been avoiding a lot of problems in their life, especially with family and had isolated themselves from close friends, um, their family members. And that to me really evokes what Frankenstein's monster (laughs) must go through, right? Like you feel disconnected from the world. Mm -hmm. You can tell that you don't belong. And in the dream, the person chasing them, they mention, is someone that used to be a friend. So you have this container in the dream itself of that feeling of alienation as the, the, the old friend in the dream. So this really striking symbolism that's speaking to this narrative in the dreamer psyche of their years of anxiety, of isolation, of depression, and how they feel like they don't belong, but at the same time, the dream as a commentary on subjective dynamics, inner dynamics, is that you're perpetuating that cycle. You know, you project that you don't belong or you, you're not able to face your own anxieties. And so you continue to push away. And that creates a sort of self-fulfilling proce- pro- prophecy of not feeling like you belong with the greater collective. Right. So she's seen children of people that she used to be friends with Mm -hmm. or at least went to school with. Mm -hmm. And so there's this feeling of maybe lost um, opportunities Mm. or wasted life when you see people who have children and they're 
children are thriving, playing soccer together, and you recognize, I don't have children. In fact, I'm a freak of nature, mm-hmm. and I can't even stop to, like, mingle and be part of this um, wholesome, healthy world. I just have to, like, pass it by and look at it and keep running. And the chaser turns out to be a cyborg. Yeah. Which is sort of an interesting twist because the cyborg is also kind of a freak. Mm-hmm. Not a human. Not a human. Frankenstein mm. is kind of like an old-timey cyborg, <laughs> kind of like pieces of humans put together. Mm-hmm. And with science, like, turned into a creature, and a cyborg is sort of a similar idea, though maybe a little more put together, a little more sleek. Mm-hmm. The dreamer mentions that this cyborg-type chasing figure is part of a dream series that they have been experiencing dreams where they're Mm. being hunted by some sort of cyborg figure or a police uh, kind of military individual with heavy armor. I see Robocop. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, And and specifically they say that dehumanizes them. So there's this feeling of whatever's chasing them is representing this archetypal container of disconnection from human spirit and consciousness. And that's shown in the dream, both as you, the dream ego. So something in the conscious attitude feels disconnected from um, humanity, I might say, Mm -hmm. but also deep in the shadow is a perpetuating dynamic that's chasing you as well. So there's both a cohesion in these reinforcing one another, uh, but at the same time, there's a shift and a change towards something so human that it, I, I don't think you could come up with a more typical example than a pregnant woman. It's like the complete opposite of the cyborg, right? Right. She is the crucible of life. Yeah. She's uh, pregnant with the new energy that's going to come forward. And so the, mm. the picture in the psyche that had been the, the dehumanizing cyborg figure is actually behind the veil a potential for development new energy new life the creation that is waiting to be born that's being gestated right now in the unconscious right and this seems related to the kids playing soccer Mm. seeing the family who has children right the old the people you that you could have become Mm -hmm. you were once equals with these people that you went to school with They turned out to have children who Mm. play soccer now. You're Frankenstein now. Mm. But then a pregnant woman enters the scene and there is sort of a feeling of like, well, maybe there's still a chance or or maybe I can, in fact, join the the group of healthy parents Mm. who have kids. Mm -hmm. And she hands the pregnant woman a queen chess piece, which again is another... Chess is weird, but the queen is obviously a feminine symbol. Yes. But it's also, strangely, I would say, since chess is such an old game, but the queen is like the most powerful piece on the board, but also feminine, mm-hmm. which is sort mm-hmm. of counterintuitive, while, while the, the cane is like the weakest piece on the board almost. Not true, the pawns are, I guess. But anyways, <laughs> um, so this powerful object, symbol, a powerful feminine Mm -hmm. Um, artifact being handed to the pregnant woman. Yeah. Um, Probably the pregnant woman is a part of herself. So Mm -hmm. it's like the shadow monster is handing some kind of feminine power to the healthy side of herself. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're making a connection between these, these fractured selves, Mm -hmm. Um, a darker, side a banished side that maybe actually possesses more power is handing that power over to a maybe lighter potential side Mm -hmm. of the pregnant woman yeah the queen in chess is interesting because her power allows her to be extremely adaptable like she can do everything right like she can move diagonally she can move in an L shape like the knight like she no she no. can't do that okay well, <laughs> whatever she's really powerful she could do all these things right I'm not a good chess player guys <laughs> no, <it's just> <laughs> the queen could just like move wherever she wants right she's I thought do she could moves, do everything right? anyways the point is she's the most powerful piece 
on the chessboard. Yeah, and she, she can is. move in many directions. I yeah. I added to say, and that to me speaks of adaptability. It's, it speaks to like the feminine style of venturing out rather than yeah. like the forceful kind of masculine hero. It's uh, more like adapting to the environment and also. Uh, kind of tapping into the feminine of relationality. And one thing the dreamer mentions is that they've lost connection with people through this period of darkness and depression. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be, at least lately, a kind of turn in that. Maybe they're getting a little bit less isolated. So how is the queen, the pregnant woman, a symbol from the psyche of what you can embody, both as the potential for new energy and kind of like life energy and libido to really flow, but also to take a both receptive feminine principle and also an active feminine principle and like kind of move out into the world and start to reconnect with these people that you've lost touch with. Um, kind of knowing that you have this capability behind you, some sort of structure of, of potential and like, yes, I can attitude that the queen chess piece does because she's like, she, she kind of can turn the whole game around, right? When she comes out, mm -hmm. When she's on the board, she can move everything into a totally different direction. And so it's there certainly seems to be an invitation to embrace the active, powerful feminine principle as well as the more nurturing, receptive principle. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow org. Do you have a dream you'd like us to analyze? Head over to goldenshadow.org to submit your dream for possible interpretation on a future episode. Thanks for listening. Until next time.